Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our online book release party of Hurricane America. I am your host, Mario Matthews, author and operator uh, of Minutes Till Dawn Production. Uh, Minutes Till Dawn is an entertainment media production company focused on empowering Black families. And today we have a very special event, the online book release party of our new book, Hurricane America. So um, I am the first author of this book. I am also with my grandmother, Dolores Matthews. Uh, she is also the author to this book. And uh, we are releasing it on June 1st, 2021. And it's going to be released on all different types of platforms. It will be released on Amazon. It will be released on Barnes and Nobles, Ingram Spark, Dolco, and uh, those are the primary platforms. But yeah, this is our new book. It is amazing, and we really appreciate you guys for joining us. Uh, Grandma, would you like to say something? Introduce yourself to the audience, please. Hi, um, I'm Dolores Matthews. I'm originally from New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, I'm, I live out here in Arlington, Texas, by way of Katrina. I've been out here for the past uh, 16 years, um, and and I, I'm loving it. Amazing, I, amazing. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry. You have something oh, go ahead. On? Awesome. Well, our new book, Hurricane America, is... Uh, the story of Hurricane Katrina 2005, uh, based on true events as told by myself and my grandmother Dolores, we are telling the before, during, and after effects of, of the on the ground conditions of Hurricane Katrina. And uh, we are telling the conditions that the average Black family was subjected to during the time and the lack of wealth and uh, uh, readiness or pre preparation in order to get um, get active about these types of event and what we can do as a society at the American society, the US government, what we can do in order to help black families prevent these type of atrocities from happening in the future. It tells our story from New Orleans, Louisiana to Texas and the, all of the amazing people and all of the amazing things that happened to us along the way uh, on our journey to reunification. So thank y'all. We really appreciate y'all for joining us today. This is a, this is a, a 138 page book. So it is not very long at all. It is, um, it tells a lot of different, um, um, topics that is relatable to the Black community in particular, Black American. And um, as you can see on the cover, it has my uh, temporary Texas state ID, along with my grandmother's on the back. And uh, yeah, this, this is amazing. This is a great book for all ages. Uh, and we hope that this book will be taught in schools and in classes to help people understand the importance of this event and what we can learn from it to help people, communities in the future, especially communities of black people who are descendants of American slavery. So with that being said, Grandma, I have a question for you. Uh -huh. <laughs> so in relation to the book, Hurricane America, uh, when we were creating the book, what was one of the uh, what was one of the things that came to mind? With like one of the very uh, important things that came to mind when creating this book, like what was your feelings and thoughts about putting word to paper as we were doing it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Hurricane America was uh, so much, at least Katrina was so much different than any other hurricane that I have ever experienced. The first one I know of was uh, Hurricane Bessie. But this particular one here, while I was an adult, I was not prepared for anything. I was not money-wise prepared. I was not 
physically prepared or, or anything. I had nothing. And um, my word to a lot of people, when going uh, to make, make preparation for a rainy day, always put something on the side for a rainy day. You never know what will happen. And you want to be prepared because when that time comes, you have to get up and you have to go. But my mistake was staying in because the fact that this is something that our family and many other families in New Orleans would stay home for a hurricane party. Yeah. We didn't expect the uh, catastrophe that went on during this, this period. We thought it was going to be like any other hurricane that we experienced. And we just ha was to have a good time, barbecuing, uh, dancing, and cracking jokes and stuff like that, playing cards. But it, it really fooled us this time. So to be prepared for a, a hurricane, a volcano, eruption, fire, whatever, prepare yourself in advance. You know, my mother used to always have this little uh, metal box mm -hmm. with all her important documents in it. And if we would be able to get a, a metal box and put all our important documents like birth certificates, social security cards, or insurance papers and whatever, all we have to do is just grab that and go ahead on out the door. And we will be prepared for for, for what, what's, what, what lies ahead. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I just wanna make sure that we highlight that you know, as uh, people prepare for, you know, natural disasters and man-made disasters, um, we want to make sure to highlight, especially in our book, that, um, you know, preparation or success is in the preparation. But what happens when you do not have the tools necessary to prepare for success? And uh, by that, I mean uh, wealth. So in, in our community, in the Black American community as of, of, of well, even today, but back in 2005, um, you know, Black American communities uh, exist, unfortunately, at the, at the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to so, uh, economics. And uh, unfortunately, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where, um, you know, since the dawn of slavery, we have been socially, economically disadvantaged in the United States of America, and one would have hoped that um, that problem has been solved a very long time ago. However, um, you know, according to data, such um, data sets that have been released from the Federal Reserve, um, we actually know that Black American uh, communities, uh, we hold less than 3% of the national wealth in America. And uh, it's, unfortunately, that wealth translates into a whole plethora of different things. When you have wealth, you have the disposable um, funds and income to prepare for events such as natural disasters, among other things. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so without that wealth, without that communal uh, you know, that important communal peace within the United States of America, we always find ourselves on the back, on the back end of things, uh, trying our best to piece together a puzzle with no puzzle pieces. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? That's, that's the best way I could put it. Um, for example, in the book, Grandma, right? Uh huh. Um, you know, it was, it was stated in the book, one of our, um, living conditions in your house was no running water, okay? Uh, at the time, there was no running water, and it was very difficult, you know, saying to, um, to actually get your bills in line so you can have disposable income to do things like properly prepare for a hurricane. And at the time, that was one of the challenges you know what I'm saying? Uh, can you speak a little bit more about that during that time? Uh, because of lack of preparation, I, I did have three jobs during that particular time. Mm -hmm. And um, what I did, I wasted money on foolish stuff. And 
when it was time to pay the bill, I was I didn't pay the bill during that particular time because of some, uh, something else came up. But when Hurricane Katrina hit, and I did get the money for the pay the bill, it was too late for them to come out, to um to turn 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 it back on, and therefore during that particular time we did not have running water in the house, and for four days. We was in a house with no running water. You can imagine that. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, and this is this is the important things. Um another another thing in our book was the um, you know, the fact that in my household, my mom, my mother's household, we didn't have any electricity. You see what I'm saying? So it is one of those things where it's like you live in an environment where you have, um, it was the dawn of the gig economy, where you have people trying to piecemeal their lives together with all these different sources of income. Unfortunately, they're still unable to generate wealth from labor alone. And that's essentially what we found ourselves in, but it's a little bit more deeper than that. The thing about it is, is that, you know, as Black American descendants of slavery, um, we should have had wealth a long time ago, i.e., you know, due, the, uh, due to reparations. Uh, however, that never happened as of yet. So with that being said, as a community, not just one household or two different households or things like that, as a community, uh, we've yet to realize that 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 crucial piece is necessary for us to be able to have a quote-unquote stable middle-class lifestyle uh, due to the fact that we have not received that which is owed to us and the many things that happened after the dawn of slavery. We're talking about the Black Codes, we're talking about Black Wall Street and all of the um, lynchings, race riots, lands being stolen and all those things. Uh, we've had obstacles in our path here in America to accumulate wealth on a communal level. And so since those things have happened, we found ourselves as a community, um, unfortunately lacking the resources necessary to not only help one or two households, but to help a whole city and, and sometimes even a state from, you know, um, weathering a storm of this magnitude or even a man-made disaster. So with that being said, um, I would like to actually go into a, another uh, question, if you don't mind, Grandma. Uh -huh. So during our book, we also have, um, you know, portions of our book that describes how, how much people needed help in the environment. And, um, you know, sometimes it is not just black folks. We have some, you know, some folks of other communities with us as well. Um, however, the majority of people that experienced all of that pain and suffering during that time was knee deep in poverty or head deep, if, if, if you, you want to use the expression. So can you explain, Grandma, that moment when you, uh, the part of the book where you're on the bridge, um, when you are escaping the flood waters and you guys got to um, the interstate bridge in, in the neighborhood in the Seven Wall. Can you exp uh, explain a little bit about that situation? Well, when we got to the bridge um, from a boat, uh, there was uh, there were a lot of people on the bridge. I, I, when it was like a, a whole city that was sitting on top of the bridge. Mm -hmm. There were old people, young people, but the thing was, there were so many people up there, they haven't had baths in days, they hadn't had food in days, there was no drinking water or anything, and there were a lot of people that needed medical attention uh, too. And we wasn't able to help a lot of people, but just a few people. I remember three ladies, three old ladies I was with, and um, we, I, I was me and my family was able to manage to help them a whole lot. Um, 
it was so many people out there that um it, it almost scared you because you had all all walks of life there. Mm-hmm. You know, you had gangsters out there, you had people out there smoking marijuana and all kinds of different things. And you know, a lot of this we wasn't able to deal with it because we didn't know what we was we, we was in for what we was in for. But uh, I, I'm sorry, mm. I, I'm just getting full. Uh, every, every time I uh, every time I talk about it, I, I actually get full. Yeah. But um, take your time. A lot of things that happen up on the bridge, we really we didn't expect. Mm-hmm. There were uh, people from all areas, uh, from the Seven Ward Gentilly area that was in, on top of the bridge, and we it was our family was like in a little hurdle in one spot and it you know all you just see young people uh middle-aged people just walking up and down the bridge you know uh cussing and fussing and all this kind of stuff on the bridge it i i can't go no further i'm sorry yeah no i understand grandma i understand you know the thing about it is it, it you know i had in our book it, it explains it a little bit but i had a similar experience um you know, when I was actually across the Mississippi River on the West Bank, um, you know, as you know, my mother, you know, your daughter, <laughs> my mama, her household was on the West Bank at the time. And so was, um, you know, her sister, uh, my auntie Keisha. And I actually um, was with Keisha at the time of everything the hurricane passed over. And uh, we were in this uh, tower that she lived and worked in that uh, we held up in and in, inside of the tower was a lot of disabled and needy folks. It was a it was sort of a, a clinic the, you know, tower where a lot of elderly, disabled and needy folk lived. And man, it, it was crazy. It, it was crazy. Uh, when the powers went out, you know, a lot of people started to, um, to, to really panic um, and reason being is because a lot of the equipment that, um, you know, that kept people on life support a lot of the times, um, it, it started to, you know, it, it started to get real dicey due to the fact that the backup generators didn't last very long. And at the time, once the generators gave out, uh, people started to die of, you know, dehydration. They started to you know, uh, unfortunately, a lot of life support machines gave out and people died and the little staff that was around there was just running around with like, like, like their heads was on fire. We try to help as much as we can, especially since my, uh, my auntie worked there. But unfortunately, there was just a lot of people who, who needed help and who shouldn't have been there. But unfortunately, they were there. You feel me? Um, and with that being said, uh, Grandma, can you tell us a little bit about the evacuation process? Like how how you know you and my brothers and sisters, because they were with you at the time, how you guys got from you know uh, the bridge uh, being stranded on that bridge to um, you know the transportation that will ultimately lead you to Texas. Okay, at first, uh, a helicopter, there was a helicopter that came out, several hel- helicopters, but because of the vast amount of people that was on the bridge and it was pushing it and trying to be the first on the bridge, the hel- helicopter ceased. So therefore, we had to stay on the bridge another day until they made, uh, the, the city came in with some buses from all different places. And there was a bus that came and picked us up and transported us to one area of the bridge because we couldn't go no further. And it, it took us out. Mm-hmm. So we was transported by uh, 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 buses. We didn't exactly know where we was going. All we know that we was getting on buses. Mm-hmm. Every bus was not going the same direction. Each bus had its own map. It was already mapped out where, where they were going to take the people. So what's what happened? Our bus brought us to Houston, Texas. 
Mm-hmm. And so um, it just it just so happened that you guys was going to Houston. Y'all did not plan that whatsoever, right? Right, we didn't plan it at all. And and none of the officials or anything told you guys exactly where y'all was going. There was it, no it, signs it, it, or anything. They didn't tell us anything. Mm-hmm. And therefore, when we got to Houston, uh, many people that was on a bus with us could not find their family members because it was on another bus. And that bus that their family members was on had went in another direction. So therefore, it was such a big chaos. Yeah, and that was the whole thing. Uh, that was the whole thing on the news at the time about how families were displaced all over the place and people right. didn't know where they were. Yeah, it, it was very, very, very badly handled. Um, how my, how me, my, uh, my auntie, my auntie, and my, uh, my mama, how we got out. Um, you know, it's actually discussed in the bus. I'm not going to spoil too too much of the book, but we actually got a bus ourselves, but we took one from a local um, local uh, uh, schoolyard or whatever. Because, I mean, look, at the time, we was running out of food, water. Uh, we was already there for almost a week. And, you know, at that point, we had people in the neighborhood, especially elderly folk in the neighborhood, that really needed some help. And, uh, you know, luckily my mama, she had, you know, she had brought our family to Texas before, so she knew the way. So all they needed was transportation. And we got some, and we actually saved a lot of people's lives. Like, I am very, pr- like, thinking about it now, you know, how, how crazy it was at the time, you would never expect, like, ordinary people do extraordinary things and i am very proud to say that you know my mama did something very heroic and very praiseworthy when she helped get that bus from where we were to texas you feel me and my cousin lamel he did an extraordinary job man everybody was just like it, it, it was it, it was crazy. It was crazy. And everybody along the way, you know, that helped us get from one place to the next was amazing. Um, you know, despite all of the, the craziness with the response from the U.S. government and everything, uh, local, state, and federal, we still had people on the ground helping us. So police officers was helping us. Like, there was a lot of people who actually understood the stress that we were going through, even when we, uh, you know, even when we would hit up convenience stores and stuff like that for food and water, because the neighborhood was out of it, you know, we still had people looking out for us, you know, uh, knowing just how stressful and destructive everything was around us. So with that being said, man, like, I have to applaud you know, a lot of different people in the community at the time, uh, in New Orleans, Louisiana, police officers and things of that nature. I have to applaud, you know, some people who actually did the right thing. You know what I'm saying? It, it really, it was really helpful. You feel me? And uh, you didn't, you wouldn't expect a lot of that, you know, despite all the craziness that's going on. But uh, yeah, yeah, with that being said, with that being said, um, I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, actually give the floor to uh, my grandmother. <laughs> and she wants to say a few words about the future of, you know, well, not the future of our book, but more so a message to those in the future who would look at this video and read our book and try to understand the lessons that we are trying to convey to our audience. So, Grandma, if you don't mind. You know, um, things is, uh, uh, we know, since Katrina, we found out things is getting worse every day. We are facing all types of catastrophes. We are facing hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunamis, and uh, earthquakes, and volcano eruptions, and stuff like that. If your your ter- the territory the neighborhood where you live at if they tell you anything about to escape from it please escape you don't know to what measure now we, hurricane katrina came in as a 
five, a her, uh, category of five. But when it hit New Orleans, it was a category of four. But it was just as worse as it was if it was a five. So my advice to anyone, if they tell you to get out, please get out. Save yourself, your family, and whoever is around you. Try your best to try to get out. Now, most states have already made preparations on how people who are not able to get out, they made ways for you to get out. Take advantage of those, those things. Don't wait to the last minute to try to do anything. Because sometimes when you wait to the last minute, you, you, you'll be left behind. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah, uh, I also have a statement that I would like to make um, in regards to our book and anyone who reads it, the lessons that need to be learned and uh, people in the future. So Hurricane Katrina was a natural disaster that turned into a man-made nightmare, okay? I repeat that. Hurricane Katrina was a natural disaster turned into a man-made nightmare, all right? The reason I say that is because, you know, despite all of the uh, warning signs, despite all of the, uh, the previous places that was hit by Hurricane Katrina before it even reached New Orleans and the Gulf Coast, uh, we understand that unfortunately, you know, uh, local, state, and federal U.S. government officials uh, still handled the event very haphazardly. And the purpose of our book is to help the United States government properly address the issues of, you know, racism and help the black community by way of reparations and use this book as an informational tool to better prepare for natural and man-made disasters as a part as one part of an overall reparations initiative for Black American descendants of slavery. Reason being is because since the dawn of slavery, we have been subjected to a lot of different disasters, whether man-made or natural, that have decimated communities and destroyed wealth for a lot of different families throughout the United States of America. This is a call to action. This is a call to understand that as long as Black Americans to continue to be at the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to wealth, we will always be ripe for the picking when the next natural disaster occur, occur. From 2005, Hurricane Katrina, we had the 2008 housing crisis. And that crisis alone decimated Black wealth. Yet the response from the US government was negligent. Since the housing crisis, we've had numerous other storms that hit the Gulf Coast, particularly in places like Houston, Texas, that had decimated Black communities and wealth along with it. Since those times, now in this day and age, we are going through a hundred, a, a hundred year event, a once in a lifetime event called COVID-19, where black people were designated as the most likely to be sick and the most likely to die from this disaster. 
it is imperative that the United States government hones in and focuses specifically on Black American descendants of slavery in order to redress the historic atrocities that have been wrought since the dawn of slavery in order to ensure that our community is brought to the fold, to the forefront of the United States, um, United States of America as a whole. Because if we truly want to get past all of the atrocities that happen, if we truly want to be prepared and we want to be strong and we want to go forward as a community in the future, where we all can pull our weight, where we all can be productive, where we all can sit down at the table and be innovative and bring America to a new stage in its existence, then it is imperative that we ass assist with protections, provisions, and with specific resource allocation to Black Americans. And we must solve the problem of racism. With that being said, Grandma, it has been a pleasure. Can you go ahead and let the audience know where they can find you, any contact information that you're comfortable with sharing with us? Uh, we would really appreciate it. You're going to reach me at um, D-O-L-O Matthews with one T at yahoo.com. If you have any questions or any comments you want. And I'm also on Facebook under the Dolores Matthews. You can reach me under that also. Thank you. Amazing, amazing. And you can actually find uh, me at uh, minutestilldawn.com. Uh, again, that's minutes, plural, minutes, till, T-I-L-L, dawn, dot com. And you can uh, find all of my social media platforms on there under the same business moniker, Minutes Till Dawn. I am on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. I am out here you feel me and you can also find uh, a link to all of our products hurricane america my first book dream of more rise of a lion all of it is on that main website it's a one-stop shop a click away we really appreciate all the love all of the support and please stay safe you know uh, make sure your family's good and make sure that we understand the, the sacrifice needed as a country in order to address the issues that we face as a community. So with that being said, we appreciate y'all for coming. Stay blessed.